myself as a child advocate, so in my practice as an artist, researcher, teacher, I confront the politics of education to give voice to issues that affect kids. And for me, voice is something that's best transmitted through the visual image and disseminated online. Art's an amazing vehicle for inquiry, for asking questions, for connecting us to ideas through emotions, and for uncovering understanding. It alters perspectives, it transforms minds and hearts, and makes change. Art is the best agent of change. We have to right now grab the opportunity to redefine the intellectual mission of the PhD as a project. The quality, extension, and liveliness of our scholarly conversations and our relationship with various publics depends on this redefinition. Raising Creativity is a documentary film project that is my PhD dissertation. In attempting to answer the question, how can we nurture creativity in education, I've pulled together the traditional components of a doctoral dissertation in non-traditional ways. Through a series of five YouTube videos and a blog, each video represents a new chapter, and the blog extends to the discussion from the videos wherever necessary. As an art teacher researching creativity, it only makes sense that my research method would demonstrate creativity as well. Working this way frees me from the limitations of a text document while allowing me to capitalize on the amazing tools and technology we have today. Many academics are already using online video in presenting paper abstracts because of what this medium can offer that others can't. These video abstracts grew out of the realization that the internet allows us to communicate with each other in ways that were never before possible. Therefore, it allows us to personalize our papers in ways that were never before possible. Use these video abstracts creatively. Artography and arts-informed research are the two methodologies that are guiding my research. First, Artography is a method of inquiry for people like me who make art, investigate issues related to their practice, and teach art. It recognizes these three roles as one, because after all, our experience and expertise in one respect easily translates as knowledge and capacity in the other two, in ways that wouldn't be possible otherwise. For example, when I'm painting, the things I learn by being engaged in the creative process inevitably help and inspire me in my teaching and in my academic pursuits. And it works the same from the other two angles. I like to picture it this way. Let's say these primary colors represent the artist, the researcher, and the teacher. When these roles come together, you don't get a pure blue, red, or yellow anymore. You get a completely new color, a completely unique identity unto itself. This is the perspective I'm coming from in my research. Next, arts-informed research is grounded in qualitative theory, but not bound by tradition. Meaning, it's research that keeps an academic lens while embracing what alternative formats like video have to offer. In this case, I've chosen unschooling theory to provide the base upon which this dissertation will take shape. This means that the film is informed by scholarly arguments that mainstream schooling is deficient as is. No matter what theoretical framework is chosen to support arts-informed research, the basic tenets of this methodology remain the same. They are accessibility, pluralism, researcher presence, and empathy. Here's how my work conforms to these. First, accessibility about the importance of working with doctoral students so that they understand themselves as speaking to multiple audiences and of translating scholarship to larger publics and developing modes of public scholarship. Because creativity in education is something that affects everyone, not just university scholars, it's very important to me that my research be made readily available to everyone. Especially since grassroots movements such as in schooling begin with the general public. By making my research available in an open access format, that is, online on YouTube, the opportunity for distribution is wide open thanks to social media platforms that encourage sharing. 
In contrast, traditional dissertations and journals can usually only be read in university libraries or through institutions that have a subscription. Mass exposure is how this research can have its best chance at making a difference. Another advantage to presenting my work online is that it's more accessible in terms of its understandability, given that there's the visual and auditory realm to accompany what's being said. Writing actually gives you merely a partial account of what is going on. It's like having sentences which aren't completed. And if you say, well, I'm only interested in writing, what you've really done is you've made it impossible for yourself to really answer the question which is being asked by your PhD. Video allows me to layer all sorts of still and animated visuals, music, sound effects, and text together. Not to mention body language, expression, and intonation to produce a kind of super communication that makes things easier to understand and more captivating for you as the audience. The next tenet in arts-informed research is pluralism, recognizing that there's no one absolute truth and respecting diversity of opinion. Anything based in the arts is by nature non-conclusive. It requires interpretation. Even though you and I are looking at the same object in the world, we're creating slightly different visual impressions in our mind, emotional impressions in our mind. When you look at a painting, you're undergoing a creative experience similar to the painter and reconstructing in a way that is unique for you and slightly different for me. And that's precisely how participatory culture works. We throw ideas out into the world, we bring them back in an improved way because of our engagement with communities. Art-based researchers see the non-definitiveness of their work as a real strength. It prompts you to make up your own mind about what's presented based on your understanding and experiences. Because truly, what's more personally reliable and trustworthy than that? My goal in raising creativity isn't to prescribe what others should think, but instead to present informed ideas for personal interpretation on the aspects of various educational models that best nurture creativity, and to provoke discussion to that end. Great works are great because they're ambiguous. They allow for alternative readings. In order to showcase these models, I'm accessing the collective intelligence of YouTube for videos from the general public, then remixing these clips together to satisfy my research question. Where the group as a whole can put together knowledge in a more complex way than any individual member is capable of doing. By remixing YouTube videos, it means that the voices of many diverse people can be represented in my research so as to adequately address the topic and thereby bring new understanding to light. As average people develop the ability to tell their stories, we're seeing different perspectives emerge. We're seeing different groups gain representation. We're seeing groups challenge the dominant media images that have been constructed for their lives. Because new media outlets like YouTube are participatory, they're shifting the way we communicate and learn, and in turn, our behavior. The resources we now use to consume information also give us the opportunity to interact with that information and produce our own information. Jenkins calls this convergence, convergence culture. culture. is a world where we take control of the media as it enters our lives. These are prime conditions for Freire's problem-posing approach to learning. After viewing Raising Creativity, you're invited into the discussion to offer your feedback on the topic. Not only does participation from the audience respect pluralism, it also constitutes the critique phase of the creative process, a necessary step towards refinement and progress. The understanding that people can take from this research will continue to be refined as long as participation and engagement continues, evolving with collective intelligence over time. Next, Arts Informed Research acknowledges the researcher's presence, which means that this work naturally has a subjective side to it. After all, it's impossible to make art without the artist being reflected in it. And not only is that okay, it's an advantage. If research is to strike a chord with people, it must appeal to the personal rather than to generalizations, facts, and statistics. Eisner writes, 
Research with no coherent story, no vivid images, and no sense of the particular is unlikely to stick. Artistic formats offer us a narrative that helps us to make sense of what would otherwise be incoherent complexity. People live and tell stories. That's a way of thinking about experience. That's really an important piece that's often missing in the research. It's for these reasons I've chosen to appear in this film, to connect with you and to contextualize the theory around my artist-researcher-teacher narrative. Ultimately, this kind of research aims to promote social justice and positive change by evoking a sense of empathy. empathy. The ability to put yourself in somebody else's position and to imagine what that might be like. As a classroom teacher, I recognize the negative effects that bureaucratic policy has on children, wherein education is something done to them, not with them. Students in mainstream schooling are seldom offered a say in how their learning experience will unfold. When a school or a family or a culture or a community define the opportunities children have to learn, they're also defining the kind of minds that children can come to own. In a certain sense, you can think about the curriculum as a mind-altering device. Children are intelligent, passionate individuals with preferences and aptitudes that are uniquely their own. However, they remain at the mercy of those who are more powerful, which is why they need advocates in their corner to help them say their piece. Children are the last acceptably oppressed group within the world we live in. And the challenge for those of us caring about social justice issues is to make sure that those people who have been the most oppressed and most dispossessed get their stories in the circulation. As we expand who has the power to tell stories, we have the potential for stories to grab our imagination, to touch our hearts. We have evolved this powerful sense of imagination. What happens in all times of conflict and cruelty is we shut empathy off so that we can do things that are unimaginable. And the way we avoid that is by kindling our imaginations and making those things unimaginable in turn. I'm inspired by Maxine Green, who believes that the duty of education is to help students nurture their personal talents for the purpose of contributing to society and making a better, more democratic world. And I think educational research should play a role in helping to fulfill this mission. With Raising Creativity, I hope to raise awareness and spark action around the ways in which mainstream schooling must improve, as well as draw attention to the alternatives that are out there that can inform such change, or in fact, be the change. It's too important to ignore, too timely to wait, too personal, to not get involved. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs>